Rodgers at the bottom of that pile. Behind the left of Madison. He was big, fast, and courageous. He pressed forward, always with purpose, and achieved 54 of his 68 victories by knockout. While defending the heavyweight title over 11 years, eight months, the longest reign in ring history, he never lost a fight. But beyond boxing, Joe Lewis lit the torch of freedom for a segregated America to accept a black athlete. The cost to him was immeasurable. There had never been a career like this in heavyweight boxing by any man, black or white. Joe Lewis was the greatest phenomenon the ring had ever seen. There was any fighter before or since that delivered his punches like Joe Lewis. He was the artist. Each punch was sharp. Each punch was fairly short and kind of it hit and exploded. And uh, you'd see these great, big, strong guys get hit once. Just knock him out. Boom. And he hit you with that short right hand. It was devastating. He hit you over, over your jab. He hit your short right hand. He was a puncher. It's like just sort of a steady beat of uh, menace. You get closer and closer and closer, and you knew. Just one flick of that right paw, and it was all over. There had never been a meteoric rise like this in the history of boxing. It was unprecedented. By June of 1936, Lewis was 27-0 with 23 knockouts. He had already beaten two former champs, Primo Carnera and Max Baer, and was about to face a third, Max Schmeling of Germany. An 8-1 favorite, Lewis trained lightly and played hard. He was living large. He was making a ton of money. Here is a sharecropper's son, and all of a sudden, he's a national hero. Joe Lewis was just getting seduced by the fame machine. He was a superstar. Women were throwing themselves at him. He was discovering golf and fancy clothes, and he really didn't prepare right for Max Schmeling. He has puffed up Lewis's left cheek, and Lewis is down. Lewis is down, hanging to the rope. The first Lewis Schmeling fight was one of the greatest upsets up to that time in the history of heavyweight boxing. Lewis was on a road for the championship. Undefeated, untied, virtually unscored upon. Schmeling's upset of Lewis was amplified around the world by the Nazi propaganda machine. Nazi Germany didn't think Schmeling had a chance. They just sent him off. When he wins, he's brought back on the Hindenburg. He's given martial music, parades. They embrace him as basically the champion of the Aryan Race. The first Lewis Schmeling fight was simply a fight until Lewis got knocked out. From that point, it became propaganda. He didn't represent America to anybody until he got knocked out. Now all of a sudden, he represented America. He thought he'd given up all that he'd worked so hard for. Not only had he let him, himself down, he let his family down. He let millions and millions of Americans down, black Americans who were seeking and hoping that he would be the next heavyweight champion to prove that the most powerful individual in the world can be a black man. In black communities throughout the U.S., there was mourning. This was a young man who had given hope to many black people in what was still the Depression. This was a symbol of rising expectations, of hope, and certainly it was destroyed. When Joe Lewis fought, it was like a holiday in black America. When Joe Lewis lost, it was like a death in the family. The effect on the white community was more complicated. The reaction to my father's defeat in 1936 was mixed. 
I think there were a lot of white Americans who didn't want Joe Lewis to become the heavyweight champion. People could not believe, did not want to believe, that Lewis had lost. In the white communities, there were many who said, yeah, he finally got it. As tensions mounted between the U.S. and Germany, a rare opportunity arose for the contender. As the lesser of two evils, Lewis would get first crack at champion Jimmy Braddock, despite his convincing loss to Schmeling. Joe Lewis's good citizenship, sportsmanship, honest decency, and the fact he was an American all helped him get that 1937 shot at Braddock. The reason that Joe Lewis got the opportunity to fight for the heavyweight championship was that a lot of America would really rather risk having a black champion than a Nazi champion. With the fight scheduled for June 22, 1937 in Comiskey Park, Lewis, mindful of his mission, trained with a warrior's focus. Leveling Braddock in the eighth round, Lewis, at 23, was the first black champion since Jack Johnson reigned 22 years earlier. Still stinging from Johnson's in-your-face attitude, America was conflicted in its appreciation of Lewis. There was a tremendous amount of discomfort with the prospect of the second black heavyweight champion in American history. Even Ring Magazine would concoct a myth that Joe Lewis really wasn't black to cushion the blow when he became champion. All the white people were rooting for Joe's opponent, and all the black people were rooting for Joe. Friends of mine, kid, other kids, they, they were anti-Lewis simply because he was black. When you hear the announcer say, although colored, clearly what you're saying is this is not a gentleman boxer. This is possibly an animalistic sort of creature that we have here, but it certainly is a less than white human. They were just giving them all sorts of ridiculous names that were indicative of the racist kind of coverage of the time. They were calling him the Zooming Zulu, the Tan Tarzan of Thump, the Sable Cyclone, all these bizarre nicknames that have to do really with the color of his skin more than anything. While white America struggled with its own mythological fears and racial paranoia, every citizen of every black community from Harlem to Watts revered Lewis as something close to a god. Joe was one of the guys who was able to rise above the restrictions because of his boxing excellence. And in segregated neighborhoods, there was a tremendous, tremendous emotional outburst when he fought. We gathered around the radio, and you could hear a feather drop, not a pin. Nobody talked. Prostitute did not work the street when Joe Lewis was fighting. You could go into a bar or tavern and nobody would be arguing. Everybody would be pinned to the radio. Few people in the history of this planet have ever been able to do that. Everybody was quiet and listened. Once Joe Lewis knocked someone out, it was always like a celebration. What could be more delicious than the sight of a black man, a powerful black man, standing over a fallen white guy. You know, the imagery is unmistakably powerful. We didn't know anything about football, basketball, baseball. We wanted to be boxers like Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis was the Green Hornet, Superman, Batman, Dick Tracy. All these people rolled into one for African Americans. For all the glory heaped on him, Lewis remained chastened by his defeat a year earlier to Schmeling. A rematch would have to wait until 1938. My father didn't feel that he was a true heavyweight champion of the world because he had to defeat Max Schmeling because Max Schmeling was the single individual who had defeated my father. The 1938 fight, the second fight, was the most sociologically important fight in the history of boxing. Might have been the most sociologically important sporting event in the history of sports. It was that big a fight. A couple months before the fight, Franklin Roosevelt invited Joe Lewis to the White House and felt his bicep and told him and the press, we're going to need muscles like yours to defeat Germany. What more do you need than that? The papers were not always too kind to Joe because of his race, but this marked a sea change in attitudes towards Joe because he was no longer a black fighter, but he was a fighter fighting Nazism. The whole notion of Nazi Germany the Aryan race, uh, the superior race, was being challenged by Joe Lewis, who was a black man. 
even the worst bigots wanted him to defeat Max Schmeling in their Riemann. In 1936, when Schmeling beat Lewis, Joe Lewis was a black man. In 1938, when he fought Schmeling for the second time, Joe Lewis was an American. But deep within him was a bitter understory common to every black soldier, a conviction that the freedom they won would not be theirs. Joe Lewis was born in Alabama. It was a large family. It was a rural family. He was a descendant of a slave owner named James Barrow. And his given name was Joseph Lewis Barrow. Joe grew up in an area uh, where there was really no racial prejudice. You know, everybody was born black and white. Lewis's father was declared insane and wound up in an institution. He was raised by his mother and his stepfather. Joe's stepfather, Pat Brooks, brought five children of his own to the Barrow family. In 1926, the family picked up and headed north out of Alabama. After World War I, hundreds of thousands of African Americans moved up from the southern states to work in the uh, auto plants and all the other industrial plants in, in the north. Family moves to Detroit. His mother wanted him to play the violin. He actually took lessons. But most times, he would just walk out of the house with his violin case, go to the gymnasium. The money that he was spending for violin lessons, he started spending it to rent equipment to box, unknown to his parents. He didn't want his mother to find out he was boxing. Once she did find out he was a boxer and wanted to pursue boxing versus violin lessons, uh, she simply said, be the very best. At 18, Lewis began his amateur career in the Brewster Recreation Center. When it became clear that he was championship material, Joe won 50 of 54 bouts. He was schooled by his two black managers to behave in a way that white America could accept. Lewis came along with this very carefully crafted public image to make him acceptable to the white public. For almost 25 years after Jack Johnson, became heavyweight champion. Blacks got no shot at a heavyweight championship match. They knew the public remembered the reign of Jack Johnson, how Johnson had taunted opponents, how Johnson had been flamboyant, how Johnson had openly gone around with white women, things which were resented by white America at that time. Jack Johnson drove the white establishment nuts. He was cocky, he was arrogant, he was everything that would give white America a stroke. They knew they had to have Lewis behave, at least publicly, in a very, very different way. His managers gave him a written list of things he could and could not do. They were all based on him not replicating the public conduct of Jack Johnson. No braggadocio, no white women, no leering and taunting and so forth in the ring, particularly of white contenders. Go in, take care of your business in a workmanlike fashion, and get out. He was to operate at all times as a black man with dignity. He wouldn't even eat watermelon and be photographed eating it, which was his favorite food, for fear it would feed the stereotype. Joe Lewis was not a vocal person, but he understood his role in terms of breaking down the barriers in this country. Joe Lewis also held himself with a certain kind of public dignity, and black people liked that. And the fact they thought he was superior to Jack Johnson in that way, and didn't do anything publicly to embarrass the race. Jack Johnson wasn't in Lewis's corner, literally and figuratively. He had applied to Lewis to train him. One of the conditions was that Lewis fired Jack Blackburn who had fought Jack Johnson way back at the turn of the century, and they were enemies. Not only would Lewis have nothing to do with it, he viewed Jack Johnson as 10 miles of bad road. Using Johnson as a model of what not to be, Lewis developed a persona straight out of the Boy Scout manual. He was kind, considerate, polite, and self-effacing. You'd knock a guy out, and you'd get on, get on the radio afterwards and say, another lucky night. 
<laughs> nothing lucky about it. He killed the guy. Oh, I felt fine. I had a tough fight, and I had a fight. I fought a tough man, and he was a very good fighter. He understood the impact he was having. He also understood that he was giving hope. When he would walk through the ghettos of the society, and people would walk up to him and shake his hand and tell him, thank you, champ. Those were the things that meant so much to my father. A black man, when he lost to Schmeling, Lewis's pigment would not be relevant on the night of their 1938 rematch in Yankee Stadium. With Hitler on the march in Europe, Lewis fought for all America. The second Lewis Schmeling fight is probably the most political sporting event of the 20th century. At the time, Hitler and fascism were goose-stepping across the globe. That fight was seen as the laboratory for the theory of, of Aryan supremacy. People thought it was a dress rehearsal for World War II. There was nothing like it in the history of sports. It did seem as if in fighting Max Schmeling, he was fighting the very quintessence of evil. I'm happy that I have the chance again to fight for the title. The world wanted my father to defeat Max Schmeling simply because they wanted to send the clear signal to Germany that there's no such thing as the master race. The propaganda machinery on both sides of the ocean was so intense, it looked like democracy versus fascism. Schmeling represented Adolf Hitler. Joe Lewis represented Franklin Roosevelt. With Hitler having annexed Austria in March of 1938, the pre-fight buildup moved from the sports section to the front page, all across America and Europe. This is no longer a prize fight. This is about bigger stakes. This is about whether they have something in their little nasty DNA pool that is better and purer than our polygot and self-evidently flawed democratic DNA pool. People think that I'm going to the rain gun shy. Why should I go to the rain gun shy? when Smelling's two years older, and I'm two years smarter in boxing. Joe Lewis had a sense of responsibility. He was fighting for America and the blacks. Of course, there was a lot of pressure on Lewis to win that second fight. The thing that excited me most in the second Smelling fight, when the guy said that the American is coming in the ring. Well, I had never heard anybody call a black American, an American. The eyes of the world were on Yankee Stadium on the night of June 22, 1938. Lewis came out, and this time, instead of waiting to counter, he attacked. I don't think there's ever been a more ferocious single minute in the ring than the beginning of that fight. Derrick is going down. Body held to his feet. He trapped Schmeling on the ropes. Schmeling turned his torso to avoid a right hand, and Lewis lands the punch in the middle of his back, and he breaks two vertebrae. Schmeling screamed in pain like a wounded animal. I'd never heard a man scream and holler like he did. Oh, no! Oh, no! And holding his hands up, oh, no! Lewis measured him right to the body, a left up to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. He said he could see in my father's eyes a, a level of determination and drive and tenacity. Um, and he knew no one could have defeated Joe Lewis on that night. The fight is over on a technical knockout. Max Schmeling is beaten in one round. At that moment, it felt like Joe had knocked out Hitler. The beating ended at 2.04 of the first round when Schmeling hit the canvas for the third time. Never had a victory been struck more clearly. Never had America loved a black man so completely. It was Mardi Gras. It was Liberation Day Paris. It was Fourth of July. It was everything. I don't even know whether we heard <laughs> what actually happened. All I know, it seems like the whole world was roaring. Joe Lewis was the hero of the hour, not just to black America, but to all America. For the first time in the history of the U.S., the national hero was a black man. So Joe Lewis defeated Max Mellon. It was a huge victory 
for the national ego, our sense of we can beat them. They're not superior to us. Joe Lewis, in his way, put an end to these notions of racial inferiority. Joe Lewis said with his fists what we couldn't say politically, couldn't say socially, couldn't say economically, and he did it as a gentleman. Joe Lewis transcended the race and transcended being the heavyweight champion of the world to an individual who gave hope to an entire generation of Americans and many people throughout the world as well. Even white folks on the job that would say nigger 50 times a day, that would say boy this and boy that, they would light up when they talked about Joe. Joe Lewis spoke for the people, not boxing people, not African Americans, not white, the people. The first stage of acceptance for a lot of sports writers was to patronize him, to start calling him a credit to his race. And that was when Jimmy Cannon wrote his classic line saying, quote, Joe Lewis is a credit to his race, the human race. But deep below the surface, Joe's victory as a boxer rang a sour note. In the house of America, he still lived in the cellar. Americans took him to their heart as no one had been before. The saddest part of it is that it never translated. It never carried over. It never occurred to those Americans that the guy who was defeating the Aryan champion couldn't go into some places in America. That those people who were applauding him and claiming to love him wouldn't let him eat in their restaurants. So here the irony was that this was a black man holding up the flag for freedom and democracy, uh, but yet he couldn't enjoy those freedoms. He couldn't live the democracy that he was fighting for. He would take on the so-called bum of the month, which meant that they weren't first-rated heavyweights, and defeat them all. The first Billy Kahn fight came at the end of an era called the bum of the month, but Kahn was far from a bum. In June of 1941, after 13 more successful defenses, Lewis met the 174-pound White Hope. Khan surprised the champ, outfighting him for 12 rounds. An upset was in the making. Billy Kahn got cocky, and instead of going for the decision, he tried to knock Joe Lewis out. He began to try to slug with Joe Lewis, and that was the mistake. Lewis, who was losing the fight, 7-4-1 on, on most scorecards, nails him in the middle of the ring, and then puts together that classic Joe Lewis combination, head, body, uppercut, and Khan is out. I guess I had too much to win for tonight, and I tried to knock him out. Otherwise, I don't want easy. Joe Lewis, American soldier. Anxious to get into Army uniform, the heavyweight champ rushes from the prize ring where he KO'd Buddy Bear in one round to Fort J, New York. What's your occupation? Fight in. When he volunteered for the Army. He conducted some 96 exhibitions and entertained some 3 million troops because that's what he could do to support the war issue. Those are the kind of things that Joe Lewis did to prove to America that black Americans could make sacrifices even though they could not experience the opportunities of this country. We are going to do our part and we will win because we are on God's side. Thank you. Some press agent, spin doctor, told him to say, we're going to win because God is on our side. And somehow he screwed it up, but made it better. He said, we're going to win because we're on God's side. He was a simple man in his own way. He was not a well-educated man. But there was a humanity about Joe Lewis. There was a sincerity and insight about Joe Lewis. He went around with Sugar Ray Robinson and made sure that the crowds of soldiers were integrated where he and Ray Robinson boxed exhibitions. He was conscious of segregation in 1942. This part of Joe Lewis is tremendously underestimated. How racially sensitive he was behind this poker-faced, respectful, humble, modest champion. Joe Lewis 
open doors. He did the best he could. He tried to push the envelope as much as was possible and did so in his own way. He did not accept segregation. He fought it, and to a large extent, he was successful. Joe Lewis had the means and the notoriety and the abilities to deal with this whole issue of prejudice and racism. People who criticize my father for not marching, who criticize my father for not being vocal, simply don't understand that while he was in the Army, whenever he saw black troops being segregated against, he picked up the phone and called and said, it's not right down here. At Fort Riley, Kansas, Lewis interceded on behalf of a soldier whom he befriended. Jackie Robinson had allegedly struck an officer who had hurled a racial epithet at him and a second black soldier. Before military justice could have its way, Lewis persuaded the base commander to dismiss the matter, and Robinson was allowed to finish officer's candidate school. So without Joe Lewis, there would not have been a Jackie Robinson in more ways than one. In the final months of the war, Lewis and his wife Marva divorced, only to remarry in 1946 after Lewis was discharged. While he pursued his good guy image in public, privately he enjoyed the ancient privileges due all heavyweight champions. My father tells my mother that he's going to go get a loaf of bread. Well, Joe Lewis going to buy a loaf of bread. Two weeks later, after carousing, he comes back with the loaf of bread and a diamond ring for my mother. He wanted to go out and party. Joe Lewis liked women very much. Women liked him. So there was this conflict between the public image and the private Joe Lewis. He went out to Hollywood to make some films, particularly films to support the war issue. He obviously met starlets, and they were attracted to him as he was attracted to them. This guy went through, you know, Hollywood white starlets like a thresher. Pretty well documented that he had an affair with Sonia Henney, who is arguably one of the most popular women in the world. Joe Lewis's philandering may have been a rebellion against being so overly programmed. He was told what to do all through training camp, where to go, who to see, and I think he wanted to get away from his handlers. I think it was a way to be liberated, to go out at one in the morning and be free. With his second marriage to Marva unraveling, Lewis continued to party while circumstances beyond his control were closing in. He was Madison Square Garden's property to protect, and they didn't. In 1942, he fought two fights for the heavyweight championship of the world and donated entire purses. Mike Jacobs promoted the fight. He gave Joe's purse to charity, but did not pay Joe, so that Joe really earned the money, and that was uh, Problem. Madison Square Garden, filing his income tax returns, they did everything for him, failed to claim those as a deduction. From that moment on, Joe Lewis was in tax trouble. For Lewis, it was only the beginning of a long slide into tragedy. Come 47, even after the war, Lewis is out of opponents. There's nobody. There's this one journeyman out there, Joe Walcott. Well, Joe Lewis's first fight against the Jersey Joe Walcott showed us that he was no longer the Joe Lewis of story and song and youth. We were listening to the fight on the radio, and I thought he was going to be beaten. And I would go between rounds to my bed and cry. When the fight was over, I wanted to cry. I just wanted to cry. He started to leave the ring in shame because he knew he'd lost the fight. The winner by majority vote and still the heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis. There was booing. For the first time in his life, probably, Lewis was booed. And so that was the signal that it was the beginning of the last act of Joe Lewis's professional life. Lewis earned back public support by knocking Walcott out in their rematch in June of 1948. It was the 25th successful defense of his title, a record that still stands. Well, I'd like to say again that I retired tonight with my life fight. Thank you very much. For Lewis, 34, success outside the ring proved elusive. Among his investment failures were a soft drink called Joe Lewis Punch, 
the Brown Bomber Bread Company, and a fight promotion agency. But as his bank account dwindled, Joe never learned to say no. God knows what kind of financial advice he was getting or how many people had their hands in his pockets. People would be lined up and he'd be passing out dollar bills or ten dollar bills. He'd give some people a hundred dollar bill. Joe was best described as a chemist with money. He had a way of destroying it. He used to go to the golf course and he'd take, you know, those little black bags that the doctors used to carry around full of money and he'd lose all of that money. Joe had no concept of money at all. And when he was fighting, he always used to borrow money in advance from Mike Jacobs. Mike Jacobs had his tax guy deduct all the advances he'd given Joe in his four years in the Army, which amounted to about $300,000. Joe bought state dinners, spent money for soldiers, one or two gifts for ladies, but mostly in connection with soldiers and their entertainment. All of those items were deducted. At that time, Mike and his accountant knew that it would be four or five years before the government would catch up to the improper deductions. In 1950, he became the focus of an IRS audit that would result in a debt of more than a million dollars. Desperate for a payday, Lewis made a comeback later that year, losing a 15-round decision to heavyweight champion Ezard Charles. In 1951, he was offered $300,000 to face 28-year-old contender Rocky Marciano. And when Rocky fought Joe Lewis in the garden, he didn't want to take the fight. Joe Lewis had to beg him to take the fight. That's the only way that he could make some money. Well, Joe Lewis was fighting clearly just for the money. He was fighting a much younger man. He had lost most of his skills, and we were seeing a shell of what Joe Lewis had been. And Joe is a helpless figure. He looks like one of those bums he used to knock out. Finally, in the eighth round, Lewis went down twice. And the referee, Ruby Goldstein, stopped the count at eight. He did not want to count on Joe Lewis. Saddest moment I've ever experienced in boxing. Joe Lewis, lying outside the ropes, head being held by one of the writers. It was over. An era was over. Rocky really loved Joe Lewis. And after the fight's over, we're in the dressing room, and he was crying like a baby Rocky. He didn't want Joe to get hurt, you know? I cried that night, because I hated to see Joe get knocked out like he did. I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. The house. I mean, the United States. Retired for the second and last time, Lewis fought exhibitions while the IRS relentlessly pursued him. Even when Joe's mother died in 1953, the government collected the $667 she had willed to her son. When he tried to settle, the IRS prolonged that settlement, and the meter kept running and running and running. And then they used them as a symbol to discourage other taxpayers. You know, we got this guy, you're next. And he had to feel bitter, misused. It is one of the permanent stains on America that this phenomenal hero who did so much for his country would then be hurt and destroyed in such a fashion. One thing you can never say about Joe, and that is that he had criminal intent to defraud the United States of America and to treat him like a common criminal is criminal in and of itself. A weary Lewis staved off the IRS with payments gained from game shows and radio and TV commercials. I just want to say one thing. Edward and Hanley, where were you when I needed you? Edwards and Hanley, the brokers you've waited for. Lewis even agreed to return to the ring as a professional wrestler. I stopped him from wrestling. I said, Joe, you can't wrestle. I said, that's just like I said president of the United States to wash dishes. The IRS siege finally ended in the early 60s. Lewis would be taxed only on future earnings. But with no steady income, Joe spun further into decline. Then he was rocked by a punch from an unlikely source. Lewis, like many older Americans, did not relate to Ali's stats during the Vietnam War. Lewis was public in his feelings about this, 
Ali, I called him an Uncle Tom, and Lewis, who was anything but an Uncle Tom, who did not take discrimination, defamation, or insults of any kind lying down, was frankly devastating. In 1967, Lewis landed a job with Caesar's Palace. He became a greeter in Las Vegas, which might seem pathetic to some people, but really was quite wonderful for him. The reality is that Joe Lewis loved Las Vegas. Las Vegas gave Joe Lewis an opportunity to rekindle his celebrity. Despite his regenerated fame, Lewis was drawn to the dark side of the City of Lights. At that time, he was a changed person. He was drinking brandy, smoking, and uh, then subsequently became addicted to cocaine. Joe, you want a little blow, or you want this? And to be macho themselves, hey, I got all the coke you need. You want some? He became a whole different individual, and I think that he just ran his life out with really no direction in life. He became basically a lost person. He got so paranoid and crazy, he thought that when you sneezed, it was the mafia making a signal to kill you. He used to go in his room and, and seal up the air-conditioned ducts because he said that they were out to poison him. I walked in to see him, and the room was dark. Uh, all the shades were drawn. He had taken my college desk lamp and totally unscrewed it. And I said, well, what did you do to my lamp? He says they were listening to me. He was smearing mayonnaise on windows so that FBI rays would not come through and pick up the thoughts in his brain. This was a man who was descending into mental illness, as had his father. Joe's journey into paranoia climaxed on May 1st, 1970, when his family committed him into a Denver psychiatric hospital. I remember talking to my father after I signed the papers, and he looked at me and said, son, why'd you do it? Why didn't you come talk to me about it? And that was a very sad time in my relationship with my father. After leaving Colorado Veterans Hospital later that year, Joe's mental and physical health continued to fail through the 70s. Finally, he was confined to a wheelchair. His troubles with the IRS had been straightened out, more or less. But he was, in many respects, the antithesis, certainly physically, of what he had once been. People would come up and give him, give him money just because he was Joe Lewis. We wish he would have lived happily ever after and faded into the sunset and been a good grandfather and, and had all these wonderful middle-class values restored, but he wasn't. In 1978, in Las Vegas, the champ was given a night for his 64th birthday. Frank Sinatra snapped his fingers, and everybody who was important in show business and politics and entertainment came to Caesar's Palace to honor Joe Lewis who they rolled out on stage wearing a tuxedo, and then somebody wrapped a blanket around him so he wouldn't shiver. He has lost the ability to talk and to walk, and it was sad. But at the same time, seeing him always made you feel good. You're still glad to be in his presence. I felt very sorry for Joe. He always had his dignity, even if he didn't have any money. And he was always acted like a champion. I did not feel then, and I do not in memory of him now feel, that he was an embarrassment to anyone. On the contrary, I think his mark was made and his memory lives on in a most illustrious way. Joe Lewis would take his leave on April 12th, 1981. He was 66. He never boasted in victory, nor did he weep in defeat. He apologized not. He knew too well that life had 15 rounds, and none of us can ever win them all. Here he is, laying dead in a casket in a boxing ring in this tin warehouse behind Caesar's Palace. And I'm thinking how sad that is. But in death, Lewis reclaimed his pride as a former champion honored him. Muhammad walked up to me at my father's funeral and put his arm around me, and we walked off to the side and whispered, your father's the greatest, truly the greatest. Nine days after his death, one of the largest American heroes was given a military burial in Arlington National Cemetery. 
This was a great man who transcended boxing in every way. And for the time he was champion, nobody, including Muhammad Ali, was ever more revered as a champion. There are some people who are champions, but all champions are not heroes. Joe was a genuine hero. He forced America to deal with its conscience about black and white, of who can you admire, who are you allowed to revere. And had it not been for Joe Lewis, maybe the society would never have been ready for Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson always said that he wouldn't have gotten his chance if Joe Lewis hadn't come first and opened the door and proven blacks could compete on an equal playing field. I think Joe Lewis's legacy is as much, if not more, to society than to boxing because he paved the way for other black athletes to follow. When Billy Kahn slipped in round 10 of their first fight, Joe Lewis, ever the gentleman, stepped back and allowed the challenger to regain his footing. Lewis was less gracious when asked how he would approach the Irishman in their rematch. He can run, said the champ, but he can't hide. Short and to the point, like the right hand that dropped Khan for the count in the eighth round. For ESPN Classics Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.